Okay, I think we're live. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Jeremy Stern. I'm news editor at Tablet Magazine. I'm very pleased to be here today with Edward Lutwak, who's one of the foremost military strategists and historians on planet Earth and a contributor to Tablet, and also Vladislav Davidson, who is a Tablet columnist and uh, I think one of the very few uh, journalists writing in English who's been in Ukraine for the last few weeks uh, and is still in the area. So please go to Tablet uh, and check out his dispatches from Kiev and elsewhere. Uh, so we'll have about a 45 minute discussion on Ukraine before I start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, so since we are limited in time and have a hard stop at seven o'clock, let's just jump right in. Um, so I think what would be helpful for a lot of our viewers and listeners would be to get a sense of what, what exactly is the military situation in Ukraine right now? Because I think on the one hand, we hear maybe that you know, Western press might be overhyping uh, the long-term prospects of the Ukrainian resistance. But on the other hand, it really does seem like the Russian operation so far has been kind of surprisingly shambolic in certain ways with huge logistical and communications problems. So let's start by just telling us what, what is actually going on on the ground militarily. Edward, let's start with you. Well, the war is just started, actually, because uh, the bulk of the Ukrainian forces, um, or at least a large part of them, are in the Kiev metropolitan area. And the Russians have only now, this evening, approaching that metropolitan area and therefore engaging. As they do, and so they're going to discover that 40,000 troops is very few, are very few to engage in an urban area of two and a half million people. Uh, and they're going to discover the first results of the post-war kind of in capability increase, which is the arrival of some anti-tank missiles, which only the trained military can use, anti-tank rockets, which are, you know, plastic tubes point and shoot that many poor people can use, which crossed the border from Slovakia only maybe 24 hours ago, which already in Kiev. And they're going to encounter the Molotov cocktails, which are pretty ineffectual hero weapons on a level field. But if somebody is driving underneath apartment houses where people can stick their hands out the window, they get pretty deadly. Uh, you know, one out of five actually will start to fire on an armored vehicle. Uh, and that's quite enough to break up a column because as soon as an armored vehicle blows up, it blows up and blocks the column behind it. So the war has just started. However, Mr. Putin has already lost the war, in my opinion, because his war was supposed to be that uh, Zelensky escapes, the comedian runs away, whereupon his government falls apart, whereupon the Ukrainian armed forces have no orders and therefore do not resist, whereupon the Russians enter unopposed, places like Mariupol in the first few hours, Kharkiv in the first day, because it's 30 kilometers from the border, and you know you roll forward, and then of course Odessa should have fallen already. In a sense that Russians enter Odessa and nobody does much about it, and so on. That was the scenario, and I believe that the Kremlin, in the Kremlin, people like the SVR, the intelligence service, warned Putin that it wouldn't happen. They were overruled, overruled, and then progressively other people, as they actually saw this thing rolling forward, disaffected. Uh, you know, a couple of oligarchs, Deli Pasca and uh, Friedman, have defected publicly. Many other people have defected in different ways. Now that there are no flights from Moscow westwards to London, Paris, Frankfurt, or whatever, they're all jamming the flights down the Emirates, flying down to the Emirates, flying to Istanbul, Turkish Airlines, going to Uzbekistan, going to Astana, Kazakhstan to be able to from there fly westwards. Who is flying westwards? Quite a lot of the professional middle class. It's not just the billionaires and the oligarchs. Whoever can fly west is flying west. Anybody who has a multi-entry visa is leaving. And I think that the only way this ends 
is through Putin's appointees in the Kremlin, his associates, removing him uh, because of the ongoing disaster for the, uh, you know, the bourgeois Moscovites go to the shop and don't find any tomatoes, any salad, because this stuff you just track to, uh, from the Netherlands across Germany and Poland. And even if they were to be sent, it wouldn't reach Moscow because the uh, demonstrators are not going to allow trucks loaded with luxuries uh, to leave the Polish border and enter into Belarus. They just won't do that. Uh, so all of these things are happening. And there are two possibilities. Either the ruination continues with the kind of collapse of bourgeois Russia or, and the fighting progresses in Ukraine at the same slow rate as we have seen with no acceleration. Uh, you know, seeing a column, a long column of vehicles just entering a metropolitan area. Just remember, they they have they kind of have to wrap themselves around. They have to start moving. Casualties are going to be very heavy because in a built-up area, any loose civilian with a weapon he knows how to use, a weapon as simple as a Molotov cocktail, is a deadly danger to soldiers. No serious general fights in the city. That's what they're doing. Why they're doing it? Because the original presumption is that this was going to be a triumphal march into Kiev. So they're actually quite well set up for that. They're not set up for any resistance. And the amount of resistance, I don't believe that Ukrainian resistance will suddenly collapse. And so the peace talks, uh, Putin described the, uh, the Ukrainian government as drug addicts and neo-Nazis. Suddenly, Putin had to authorize the opening of talks with these drug addicts and the Nazis. Why do you have to do that? Because I believe he's under pressure, under pressure from his own colleagues and his own system, his subordinates, his subordinates who are getting to be possibly less subordinate, saying, do something, do something, so they have talks. Unfortunately, the dynamics of these talks is that the only thing the Ukrainians can do when they meet the Russians is to say, kindly withdraw, withdraw. That's the only subject of conversation. The, such a delegation cannot be authorized to entertain fanciful ideas like we will draw if you recognize the Russian takeover of Crimea. Such recognition is itself problematic because once you have declared that the Ukrainian government is nothing but drug addicts and neo-Nazis, why would you uh, want the recognition of anything? You know, you, you delegitimize. Once you delegitimize, you can't very well do that. Hence, this negotiation has only one subject. Ukrainians come there and say withdraw. And the Russians say, we won't withdraw. But the Russians didn't also say, now go home and wait to die as the army crushes you. They said, no, we're going to have talks again. So I believe that there is pressure on Putin to have talks in order to stop the ongoing disaster. Now. War is the great contingency. War changes everything. War makes pe some people rise high and throws down some others. It changes everything. The German government uh, just a few days ago tried to stop the Estonian government from handing over some old Soviet uh, 122 millimeter gun howitzer, so 1940s vintage, uh, to Ukrainians. The Germans wouldn't let them hand over because they'd briefly been held by the East German army when he was taken over by the West Germany, briefly held on that gra flimsy ground, they stopped the Norwegians. Okay, we've gone from Germany stretching a hand to stop the Est Estonians giving some weapons to the Germans sending weapons. They're sending anti-tank rockets and they're sending uh, the uh, anti, you know, the portable uh, anti-aircraft anti uh, missile, uh, which, is a decent piece of equipment against helicopters and so quite deadly against helicopters. So Germany changes policy drastically, like completely, 180 degrees. Countries like Norway, uh, which are not you know, very active and prominent, but definitely good NATO members, are now have already sent equipment, which has already reached Ukraine via Slovakia. And country like Finland, which has deviates from his 50-year-old, you know, 70-year-old neutrality policy to send weapons to Ukraine. Finland, which is right on the Russian border, which needs anti-tank rockets, is sending anti-tank rockets to Ukraine. 
for Finland, this is a giant step. You know, they, they, of course, they, they really have been neutral, uh, very neutral, and suddenly they're very neutrality, which means that the other countries, and then, of course, you have the countries that are uh, much more defined. The British government several days ago said the British citizens who go to fight in Ukraine, uh, that the British government will look after them and so on and so forth. Under, you know, many countries, including the US, have laws that restrict the ability of people to go and fight for other countries. The British did not have such a law. So the minister therefore wasn't called upon to say, yes, you can do it. Instead, she went on to say, encourage them. I don't believe that, the, I mean, the British are the most aggressive people in Europe. Just look at the football crowds. But I don't believe that these are the only people in Western Europe who want to have a go, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm 79 years old. I guess if I was living in Europe and I was, uh, even now, perhaps I might just, get in my trusty car and drive there and have a go. Having a go is a very good thing to do. It's a very good thing to do instead of standing by and complaining about it. So how many people are going to Ukraine having a go? We don't know. The weapons that are being transferred are significant. There are many tens of thousands. Early on, there was talk about Ukrainian authorities issuing a thousand Kalashnikovs. Then it became a thousand three hundred Kalashnikovs. These are very tiny numbers of the first day of the war. We have gone way beyond that because lots of small, small arms have reached Ukraine in just, just a few days, just in a few days. But then again, it doesn't take a long time to take weapons like this out of depot. Remember, these were all uh, NATO contingency depots that were organized for being, you know, the stuff to, uh, to mechanisms so you can go into the warehouse with, you know, with, the, with a front loader, take out the stuff, put it on the back of a truck. This, all this stuff has long existed because of the need to respond to sudden attack. So this stuff then add 24 hours for the transit and they're reaching Ukraine. And so the war has just started in my view. Thank you very much for that panoramic look at the uh, kind of strategic and operational and, and, and uh, tactical reading of what's going on on the ground. So, uh, Vlad, you've been uh, in and around Ukraine for a few weeks. Um, you've talked to a lot of civilians and people in the military and the government. Uh, yep. What are your eyes and ears telling you? Great. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jeremy, for organizing this. Uh, Mr. Ludwak, big fan. Uh, I just want to say that I agree with 99% of uh, what uh, Mr. Ludwak said. And the one thing that I don't agree with actually underlines this point and makes him even more correct. The official population of Kiev is 2.8 million. There are lots of people who live there without registering with a city authority. And the actual number of residents is probably certainly 4 million, if you count the, the excerpts and the suburbs and people who are living there uh, just on couches and uh, coming in and, or, in order to do day labor stuff, probably up to five. And there's some people who think that, that Kiev is a conurbation of 6 million people. Uh, it is a very widely distributed city. It's, no, it's not as big as Mexico City or Tehran, or um, you know, maybe it's not as, as densely populated as London. But it's a it's a very large city. It's the size of a small European country. The uh, it, it would it would take remarkable amount of cohesion in order to take uh, the important parts of it and to bomb into the ground uh, places like the uh, the intelligence services building, the SBU building, the um, the the defense ministry building, the the, uh, the army sections. It, it it would require five to 10 times more manpower than what the Russians have already deployed just to take it. Uh, that said, they have uh, deployed their army very badly. They uh, came in on delusional assumptions with a uh, completely unrealistic strategy for a uh, plan that failed. And on the tactical level, everything went very badly. And uh, on top of that, the Ukrainians resisted much more than they could possibly have imagined. And uh, many more Ukrainians have, have resisted much more than they possibly can imagine. And also the, the president of Ukraine, who I had had dinner with once, um, 
In fact, uh, uh, our, our colleague, uh, Bernard Anglivi, wrote about it in uh, Tablet today. In fact, uh, he, he mentioned the fact that I was the interpreter and set up that dinner. I once interpreted uh, between BHL and Zelensky the night before he became president. It was a lot of fun in retrospect. Uh, it so happens that our man, Zelensky, who was a, uh, a comedian, uh, he uh, is a combination of Benny Hill and Boris Johnson when he is elected, but now somehow he turns in, into a real boy and he's Churchill. So the president of Ukraine now has 92 or 93 or 95% approval rating because he has, he has behaved himself with perfect, uh, uh, with perfect elegance and with perfect strategic savoir and with, with just the most remarkable uh, playing of the role of a lifetime. So he has, he has been the secret sauce and that he has kept the country together for the first couple of days. Kiev, which was supposed to fall in 48 hours, not only did not fall, but it had repulsed all uh, the, the very badly planned out assaults on it. The Chechens who were supposed to kill uh, Zelensky, who were sent in first by, by the Wagner group, 400 guys, they were eliminated according to the Ukrainians. The, the Chechens who came in to kill them were also liquidated. The airdrops onto air bases and aerodromes around Kiev, like uh, the Antonov airport right uh, outside Gost uh, Gostomel, Kiev, uh, a, a tremendous World War II style battle, which where the airport was uh, going back and forth three or four times and ultimately was occupied by the Russians, but not before the Ukrainians uh, rendered it inoperative, a ruin. Uh, a, a, a badly executed assault on an aerodrome in the south of Kiev, where the Russians wanted to take it and to land more airborne troops, also repulsed. All those Russians were killed. Uh, columns and columns of tanks, which were thrown at Kiev, which just went down the, the, the north, uh, were repulsed. The uh, Russian reconnaissance and um, special forces guys who were fighting in the northern Obolon neighborhood of, uh, of Kiev, which is 10 kilometers north of, of, of Kiev. All those guys were repulsed. Uh, hundreds of uh, saboteurs, infiltrators, all over Kiev picked up. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's really difficult to tell you Russian from a Ukrainian because it's a state of mind. It's not just a, that's not a racial category or ethnic category. In fact, uh, I was walking down the street in Rivne the day before yesterday, asked for directions. And the woman asked me suspiciously, to uh, pronounce Polinitsa uh, in Ukrainian to see if I was a Russian infiltrator. And she says, where are you going exactly? What are you doing exactly? Can you, can you speak to me in Ukrainian? And uh, I had to flash my American passport, my credentials. I had to speak in Ukrainian a little bit to her. And I had to tell her my wife was from Odessa. After that, her own husband was from Odessa. She, uh, she asked me which town uh, my wife was from. And she made me say, um, uh, which town her, her husband was from in order to, to figure out uh, if I was actually infiltrator. So there's a set of paranoia and uh, the, the Ukrainians are fighting back. They're fighting back hard, but we're going to, we're going to see the, uh, uh, we're going to see a, a switch to um, airborne attacks from the air force and from uh, ballistic missiles and uh, grab rockets on city centers as progressively becomes more and more apparent that the Russians cannot take either, even Kharkiv, which is a Russian-speaking city on their border, let alone Kiev, which is a massive city with now thousands and thousands of defenders uh, by, by uh, mechanized infantry. Right, I think Edward wanted to add something to what you just said. Um, Please. Yeah, thank you for the correction about the actual population in Kiev, which is very critical. But um, Vladislav, I don't believe that Putin can authorize generic bombardment of Kiev yeah. um, because the Russians think that it's uh, quite okay to bomb Grozny uh, if it's Chechens. Bombing Chechens is acceptable to Russian opinion. Uh, bombing Ukrainians is not. Remember that the Russian invasion is to liberate and save the Ukrainian people from these drug addicts and neo-Nazis. You can't suddenly turn around and say that the Ukraine, you're not going to save the Ukrainian people, you're going to bomb them. I don't believe that the Russians have the option of generic bombardment of Kiev. But I will say this, 
in case they do generically bombard Kiev with the appropriate weapon, primarily Katyusha type rockets, that's the main yeah, thing, yes. not air power, but bombardment rockets that they can generally aim at some part of town. If they do start bombing that and you turn from apartment houses to ruins, then the defense becomes immovable because people in apartment houses are vulnerable to such tactics as the elevation of a tank gun to blow out, let's say, balconies or a floor. Once you have taken down a building, the ruins of, you know, cement block ruins are ideal to hold up the enemies. But I don't believe it's going to come to that. I do not believe that Putin has the political option of launching a generic bombardment of Kiev. He does not, if he does that, he is uphanding his own war, his own discourse, and what, what he explained that he's doing. Uh, incidentally, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the Russian intelligence service was opposed to this war. Uh, they, I mean, uh, it's not just a Narishkin video, but there are other indications. And if Putin were to order the bombing of Kiev, I don't believe the order would be carried out. And that could be the instrument of his removal. Because you mm -hmm. see, the only good scenario now for the Russian people, for the Russian people, is that Putin is removed by his own officials. So you don't have a seven year process of revolutionary change and insurrections and people being shot down and so on. No, it's removed within the Kremlin. They just take him and move him to a different group. A, pal a classic Russian palace coup, the most classic yes, uh, yeah, form of Russian same. transition. That's right. Remove Putin, save Russia. How do you say this uh, in Russian? Take down, get rid of Putin, save Russia. You know, this is the Black Hundreds had the different right. beginning to that phrase, but the second part was save Russia. That's so, right. If he orders the general bombing of Kiev, I believe he'd be removed. He'd be removed. The Russian people are, do not believe uh, I'm not going to believe that bombing Ukrainian city is legitimate. Is legitimate. It's not. They can believe that attacking the Ukrainian government could be legitimate because they could be neo Nazis and drug addicts or whatever they're supposed to be. But the idea that you bomb Kiev, that is absurd. The people who bomb Kiev, they have to be Germans and people like this. They yeah, can't be yeah. Russian. They can't be Russian. I don't believe he has that option. Well, so. Uh... Let's now um, talk about the economic dimension here because with the sanctions regime that's, that's being imposed right now, um, it, it does seem a little bit frightening that we, we seem to be forcing a nuclear superpower into a currency crisis and declaring you know, total economic warfare on the Kremlin, uh, unless our aim here uh, is that we believe we're going to induce either ordinary Russians or the Russian military or other officials in the Kremlin to rebel against uh, against Putin. So um, let's start with Edward and then go to Vlad. I mean, so what is the ultimate end game here with these sanctions? Well, the the starting point when somebody talks economic sanctions to stop a bad actor, as they call him, um, who is acting militarily or politically, when people start talking about economic sanctions you have to uh, point to the long list of failure. Economic sanctions fail. Economic sanctions at most induce a long-term weakening. So economic sanctions have never been a useful instrument. However, they are more or less a necessary instrument. If the Russians are invading Ukraine, you can't go on uh, you know, giving them uh, unrestrained, you have to have economic sanctions. You have to have them because, you know, oh, well, but you can't expect economic sanctions to induce a regime uh, put into change his mind, uh, no matter what they are. Because, uh, and of course, for the Moscow bourgeoisie, and in fact, I would say the Russian, generically, the Russian bourgeoisie, which is not so tiny anymore as it used to be, for the Russian bourgeoisie, the sanctions are a disaster. They just lost their bank account in London. It wasn't so big, but they valued it a lot. They've lost all kinds of stuff. They've lost, they can't go skiing in, you know, Curie Savelle. 
uh, they can't do a lot of stuff. It impacts on a lot of people, but I don't believe these people influence policymakers. It just makes them unhappy. I think that economic sanctions are the alibi, alibi move. You know, when somebody does something bad and you're not willing to, to take the risk of fighting them, you levy economic sanctions. But then economic sanctions don't really cause behavioral change. They do induce, of course, a long-term weakening and they might conceivably induce long-term political change, uh, but that is all. So I'm, I, I recognize that you could not, not have economic sanctions. You couldn't let the Russians unimpede the use of SWIFT. Uh, by the way, contrary to what you may have been told, what has been done so far is to cut out certain banks from SWIFT, certain banks from SWIFT, not all of them, uh, even in Russia. So the economic sanctions are necessary. It's a thing that people feel we have to do, but don't expect them to have an immediate impact. There's nothing, the sanctions do not affect anything material needed for the Russian war machine. It simply has no impact on the Russian war machine. And the only impact it has on decision makers is that it would undoubtedly contribute to the, to the, uh, you know, the pressure uh, or the incentive to people in the Kremlin who see Putin passing them in a corridor on his way to the bathroom. And they say, if only we could put this guy in, in a bathroom with his head down, we would end this nightmare. I mean, all I have to do is, is a short guy is to stomp him in a corridor, tip him over, put his head down in the toilet, flush the toilet a couple of times, and Russian condition improves instantly. So yes. sanctions do help in this very indirect way, but they don't really ever induce a constitutive government. You know, they might weaken the government and they might weaken to bring it down, but otherwise no impact. You know, because the, the powerful the powerful will get their gravy and their chocolate anyway. Um, Vlad, Vlad, what are you what, what are you hearing? Uh, I mean, what, what did you think so far? I think about the Western response, and uh, we're, we're seeing some calls from the U Ukrainian government to kind of fast track uh, possible EU candidacy uh, status, and you know, even if the EU did agree to admit Ukraine in some ad hoc procedure, uh, what do you think that would do for the country? Uh, well, there's a, it's a lot of different questions. Um, first of all, I just want to. I just wanted for 30 seconds talk about the atmosphere here. All the, the entire Ukrainian population has cohered. Now, there's no government of, uh, of unity, which the Americans tried to force on them before all this happened. Uh, Zelensky is 8,000 ton war machine at this point. He's 50 meters tall. He is a giant, a political giant. And so he doesn't need to do that. But the, there is no uh, government of unity, but there's total social cohesion. The, the Ukrainian population, even the Russian speakers, even the people in Kharkiv who are now being bombed uh, and, and had a grad rocket fall right in the middle of, of Independence Square, right in front of City Hall, and blow up and kill a couple of dozen people this morning and, and injure hundreds of people. Now, it, it, ever since that happened, so ever since they started the, the real bombing of the population centers indiscriminately over the last 24 hours, and they only started it now, the people on TV have began referring to them uh, uh, as the fascist occupiers. This is rhetoric that I've only started hearing, let's say, mid-afternoon yesterday. I watched the TV here continuously, and uh, this is something entirely new over the last 24 hours. They now refer to the, uh, the, the presenters on the news and all the news channels, which are owned by six different oligarchs, uh, they all came together and they do one live feed that the entire country watches. Uh, all the network presenters take turns producing it, but all the, the, the major channels, including the ones owned by uh, ostensibly, well, Medvedchuk no longer has a TV channel, but Firtash, who's supposedly a pro-Russian guy, and Novichkin, who is Yanukovych, uh, uh, former chief of staff, uh, they, are, they are also putting on their TV station this marathon, which every Ukrainian is watching. Everyone is watching the same TV program. This is absolutely important. The, the, the infighting of the Ukrainians, which is their natural thing, their Byzantine, uh, and I say this to Mr. Lutwak with tremendous respect, their Byzantine infighting is over. They all watch the same TV and they all march in lockstep and they're all here to fight. 
the, the, the cohesion is just incredible. And the, the news reporters and uh, evening presenters as of last night started referring to the invaders as fascist invaders. And tonight on the news, they even refer to it as the Russian horde for the first time. Utterly amazing stuff. And which tells you Ruski what the Arda, Ruski yeah. Arda. Yeah, they say the Ruski Arda. Is that what they're they saying? Yeah, they, say, oh they started boy. saying the Ruski oh Arda. And they, Very and they, significant. Extraordinarily significant. That just happened in the last 24 hours. If you watch TV here, you know that the, the people are in no mood for anything and they're going to fight. So that's, Please, that's by the way, really explain to our viewers and listeners why that's so significant. Mr. Ludwak, would you? The Arda is the original Mongol pronunciation of a word that carries into English as horde, horde. And this is the arrival of the Mongol horde in, in the Slavic world, burnt, came to Kiev and burnt the city of Kiev. Then yeah. went to Moscow and burned the city of Moscow much later, but Kiev was burnt by the arrival of the Mongol Arda, beginning a period of 300 years in which uh, all of Russia and Ukraine were under Mongol suzerainty, okay? And uh, to call the Russian army Arda means that they are outside the cultural, they're beyond the cultural border. They're not actually human beings, okay? Because fighting, you know, fighting, uh, 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 I mean, the, already the, the Chechens were in that category. When, when uh, the Putin bombed Grozny and flattened the city of Grozny, nobody said a word in Russia about it. This is what one does with Chechens. And now the Ukrainians are now calling the Russian as an Arda, as this a horse. Exactly legitimizes completely killing any of them. They're no longer the sons of, of mothers, very much like your own mother. They're no longer, no, they're people you have to wipe out. You this is absolutely yes. true. Yes. This is absolutely I, th true. I think that this, this attitude translates in tactical behavior, which in turn generates culture shock on the part of the Russian soldiers. Uh, Russian military performance has been very poor, as everybody knows. But the principal reason it was poor was no fault of the soldiers. It was that everything was set up for an unopposed march, unopposed march into Ukraine after the dispersal of the Ukrainian government and the flight of the president Zelensky. So, and they were supposed to be unresisted. So the soldiers were deployed accordingly. They were supplied accordingly. They didn't have fuel, for example, for maneuvering. Maneuvering, they run out of fuel when they tried to maneuver. They were supposed to just roll forward. You know, When you maneuver a tank and you go forward and back and sideways and back, you're using much, much more fuel than when you're just rolling forward. That's why we've had reports of armored vehicles running out of fuel. And being now stolen by stage, tractors. What, sorry? And being stolen by tractors. There, there are videos yeah, on yeah. social media. I mean, some, yeah. there were, these are colorful side yeah. episodes. But now the Russian soldiers, if the Russian soldiers are fought by the Ukrainians as an Arda, if the Russian soldiers perceive that there are mothers on balconies Mothers very much like their own on balconies who are dropping Molotov, Molotov cocktails in order to burn them in their vehicles. In they, this will be a big shock, big shock. Absolutely, I absolutely yeah. agree with that. So this I, is I, highly I, significant language. It means a lot. I I, I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. By the so, way, so, on the so Ukrainian so radio, Vanislav, what yes, Ukraine now needs is a proper war song. So the Ukrainian version, I suggest stealing the music of the sacred war. You know the sacred war? Yeah. What is, you know, down, yeah. I suggest yeah. stealing the, I, the, the I music, actually, way, putting I, it in Ukrainian words and broadcast it nonstop. That will uh, also shock the I Russians. tried, I tried, um, uh, I tried, I, pl I tried playing the sacred war at my birthday in Odessa uh, uh, in, 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 in the spring of 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, but in Ukrainian, in Ukrainian, no, in Odessa, in Russian, and uh, yeah, right. some okay. local now, Ukrainians made me turn it off. You need, I, I, uh, you I need tried to it. I, I, my, I, I'm two years ahead of you. It didn't work. Okay, no, no, but in Ukrainian, try it in Ukrainian. It's, it's an idea. It's an idea. Yes, I will present it to the government. In Ukrainian, the sacred war. 
uh, Jeremy? Yeah, let's, uh, thank you for all this so far. So um, let's move to something else. I think the, the viewers and the listeners are gonna be eager uh, for both of you and especially uh, Edward to talk about, which is the uh, possible hypothetical appearance uh, of nuclear weapons, which we heard mentioned uh, in the last couple of days. Um, I mean, it's my sense the risk of uh, a nuclear appearance is very low, but it does seem higher than it did a week ago, uh, which for many of us uh, might be the first time in our lifetimes we're able to say that. Um, so, I mean, Edward, uh, how should we think of, of, of Putin and the credibility of the nuclear threat? And also, what do we make of these reports that we see that Putin may be, you know, not in his right mind or he's gone mad? Is that just Western media trying to make sense of something they don't understand? Or well, has he kind of lost it? I, I don't know. I mean, talk of Putin uh, going mad would be very useful for the gentleman in the Kremlin whose job it is to remove him. Uh, but the fact is that Putin talk about putting nuclear we weapons on alert. This is a main, this is Putin who's discovered that instead of a march to an elegant march into Kiev, he has a war on that he doesn't know how to stop. I mean, uh, it, the only way he can stop it is to literally stop and withdraw whereupon uh, his authority will crumble in Russia, completely crumble, uh -huh. because it will take months to undo the economic consequences of what he did thoughtlessly. So he therefore talks about nuclear, okay? But the fact is that in a winter of 1950, when the American army was being overrun by the Chinese army, and the Chinese did not have a single nuclear weapon, that is the time when General Douglas MacArthur asked for the use of fission bombs on the Yalu River in order to stop the Chinese advance. President Truman said no to him, okay? So it's not like the Ukrainian army is about to march into Moscow. If the Ukrainian army was marching into Moscow, then the nuclear weapon may have some currency. In the current situation, it is absurd and nobody should pay attention to it. Because as a, in, in the current situation, a tactical missile, whether it is one of the ordinary ones or an ISKCON there along the range, such a tactical missile has ice cream warhead. The warhead where the aluminum ogive is filled with ice cream, that could still kill somebody. Whereas the nuclear weapons can't. Because if Putin were to order at the present moment, the Russian forces to launch the nuclear weapons, that's when he gets removed. The Russians have PAL, permissive action links, like everybody else has. There, there is no button in the Kremlin that will directly communicate and launch a missile. It's a command structure. So talking about nuclear weapons is just a way of making noise, trying to divert attention from what is an ongoing defeat for him but it's not at all credible. And, I, and I, he invokes nuclear weapons and nobody responds, okay? There might be a couple of, you know, crazies, uh, you know, some, some people in the European parliament too, or anyway. But, you know, Putin still has supporters in the European parliament. Uh, they're one tenth of what they were, but they're still there. He lost nine out of 10, they still got. So these people might talk about nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons were, born, and when nuclear weapons were born, they already overshot the culminating point of utility, the culminating point of utility. The United States used them because after the Battle of Iwo Jima, which is the battle to conquer the smallest of all Japanese islands in the archipelago of Japan, uh, the, the smallest, just about the smallest island, and it took thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of American dead, that in that environment, Truman could order the use of nuclear weapons. And by the way, the foolish notion that he could have had the demo shot in the Pacific is absurd because he had the demo shot in Hiroshima and still the Japanese didn't surrender. But number two, did it. We are not in those circumstances. Putin cannot say the foreign hordes are entering Moscow, they're going to rape your daughters. 
therefore I authorize the nuclear, absolutely out of the question. It's a zero probability. Any European politician should just laugh it off and say, you try and order a nuclear attack and you'll see how quickly you get removed from power. Putin knows that. I mean, he must know that unless he's gone completely overboard. Nuclear weapons are not in the picture. Now it is a story about bazookas, about LAVs, about bazookas, RPGs, hitting armored vehicles, and the troops coming out and being zapped by Molotov cocktails. That's what's going on. This is the immediate future. And in this context, the talks, which I think are going to resume tomorrow, I believe they're going to resume the talks. Those are the talks. And in those talks, I mean, the Ukrainians will say, if you stop fighting and you withdraw, uh, that's it. That's what you can do. And I think they can't do anything else. The Ukrainians cannot offer anymore. And uh, for the Russians, it becomes a good deal, uh, you know, if the damage stops. I mean, you know, every single day, some uh, tem table tennis, you know, confederation of Micronesia says they won't play table tennis for the Russians. It's got, you know, we're running down to the drags. And these are real consequences. The Russians, after all, were not living on Mars, you know. They're on the way to skiing trips when this happened. You know, yeah, they're well, on the way to, to business meetings in London. There were students on the way to go to some Berlin seminar where they managed to get a scholarship to. And all these characters, their life has been interrupted. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I, I, we, shouldn't, we should ignore nuclear weapons and we should focus on doing God's own work, which is to find and load portable anti-tank weapons and send them as quickly as possible into the border crossings and then hope that they will be delivered quickly to Kiev and, uh, and other places. And by the way, uh, our friend uh, David Sun is in Chernovitz. Chernovitz is what, 800 kilometers from Kiev? Yeah, it's pretty far. About 800 kilometers. I, ha I, had, I had to come here when British intelligence told me that I was on the, that, that oh, the, the Hitler yeah. army was about to invade. Yes. So I'm uh, going Hitler. back to Kiev tomorrow. Well, well, never mind. The point is that even if they take Kiev, they have another 800 kilometers of country to go. And uh, I don't think that they ever going to get to the stage of taking Kiev. I mean, in, given the number of troops they have, which is a very small number of troops, this whole column they talked about is at most 40,000 soldiers. That's oh, very few troops. It would take them weeks to reduce uh, Kiev, weeks. And I don't think that they can stand weeks more of this type of pressure. I mean, Putin can't. I don't think he can. No, the, tr the troops cannot. By, by the way, the, the, the Ukrainians claim that 6,000 troops have been killed. That is about 10% of the 60,000 of the original troops that were put into the, uh, into the field. They're taking 2% death rate, the Russians, per day, and it's day four, day five. If At, at that casualty rate, they'll be, they'll be gone in two weeks. They'll, it's not I, I, I don't know. I find this, I'm not terribly persuaded by these high numbers. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, and the reason I'm not persuaded is because, you know, uh, as I say, I was in war three times and I saw mm -hmm. lots of firing going on and the number of casualties wasn't that great in the end because to have proper casualties, you have to have what's now beginning in Kiev itself, namely a field army entering a city. That's when you have killing. That's when you have real casualties, okay? Some on the part of the citizens, but the citizens have options and some on the part of the attacking troops. Uh, and it's kind of a bit surprising to me that once Putin's scenario, uh, which was based on a series of best possible, op you know, a series of most optimistic premises. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Zelensky runs away, government dissolves, army doesn't fight. So the only problem in entering Ukraine is mechanical breakdowns because some of the equipment is remarkably old. By the yeah. way, I saw pictures of, of um, you know, equipment which is well over 30 years old. Uh, once you get into the 
not their hope for scenario, their dream scenario, but the actual scenario, uh, then uh, we're going to see now, I believe the war is starting now. And let's see what happens in the next, next 24 or 48 hours in Kiev. If what will happen is what appears should be happening, namely mechanized forces entering a city, getting zapped by anti-tank uh, weapons, anti-armor weapons of different kinds, and, and so on, and then beginning to try and engage with these civilians, uh, which in the, you know, they have to dismount from their BTRs, from their troop transporters, Blonde Pro, what is, Davidson, how do you pronounce that, Blonde Pro, whatever? Uh -huh. They have to get out of those vehicles and then engage them in the concrete uh, blasted ruins and so on. Then, uh, you know, then we'll see then how it goes. As for casualties to date, uh, I, I really want to accept numbers. Uh, Mr. Lutwak, I've been watching Ukrainian television. Uh, just very briefly before we uh, let Jer uh, Jeremy retake control of this thing. Uh, the Ukrainians have been showing hour after hour of interviews with captured Russian conscripts, typically terrified 19, 20, 21 year old boys. They all tell the same story. We were told we were going on maneuvers on the Belarus border. They took away my passport and my cell phone. I figured out I was in Ukraine when I saw Ukrainian uh, soldiers shooting at me. Then the, uh, my column blew up, I ran away, I was captured. There are hundreds of these stories. The Russian soldiers do not want to fight. There are rumors that uh, the uh, Russian uh, corvettes, which were ordered to uh, blow up Odessa yesterday, had mutinies on board. The multiple- Oh, oh multiple... wait, wait, wait. These are yeah. the, the corvettes that they sent into the, the waters in front of Odessa? That's right. They were supposed to fire into Odessa? Yeah, they were supposed Why to fire. Why were they supposed to fire? Their light artillery? They, they, they have to, guns. They have very small caliber guns on those corvettes. They were supposed to deposit Marines, which apparently, according oh, to okay. rumors, were uh, uh, mutinied and uh, uh, made the ships leave. The, the morale is very bad. Everyone sees this based on the but videos. There's no doubt that I have, I've seen uh, fragmentary pictures. No doubt that the current conscript intake, the ones who already had six months in the army, uh, which is basic training and what they call infantry training. Uh, those six months troops and plus have been engaged. And I'm not surprised that they will be disoriented because I'm sure that the guidance they got is that they were entering Ukraine to help the Ukrainian people liberate them from drug addicts and neo-Nazis. So once they encountered that there were no drug addicts and neo-Nazis fighting them, no Chechens and no Germans, uh, then of course it's disoriented, which means that Putin's political preparation was very poor. Horribly very poor, poor, horribly poor, horribly, horribly poor. poor. Because yeah. if he had said uh, the political preparation of the war should have been something like, uh, they're all going to pretend to be just like us and that's Ukrainian, but in reality, they're all, you know, Germans uh, under false colors or something like that. The way the preparation, the, uh, Putin's preparation was very cursory, very cursory, very superficial, and uh, wrong for the circumstances, That's which right. means that he himself believed there's going to be a walkover. The political preparation for a walkover is a simple one. If soldiers get into vehicles and they roll forward and nobody stops them, and then eventually they park in the main city and they start strolling around and looking to buy cigarettes, that uh, you don't need political preparation. If you're going to defend Moscow from evil invaders, you don't need political preparation. For. That's right. But doing okay. such a thing as he's doing uh, was a very difficult to do, and he didn't do it. And he didn't, he didn't do, do anything. I'm sure he was persuaded that he didn't need to do it. I'm sure he believed Zelensky would be out of there like a flash on his That's way right. to Hollywood, just away. And I'm sure of that. That is why I would say the war has just started. Well, let's spend a few minutes we have remaining actually talking about Zelensky because this is a tablet event and I think uh, a lot of people feel understandably that he is probably the bravest Jew on the face of the earth at this moment. Absolutely. Uh, 
but I think a lot of people are probably very confused how how this happened. Uh, this person who, to the extent people are in America were aware of him at all, understood him as a kind of clown, TV personality, comedian, and now maybe the most significant wartime leader in Europe uh, in a few generations. Uh, so Vlad, you know him a bit, Edward. Yep. You can place him uh, for us in historical context and tell us a little more about what kind of wartime leadership will be required from him uh, if hopefully he lives. Uh, so in the 10 minutes we have remaining, uh, please please tell us about Zelensky. So I uh, I had, look, I, I've, I've uh, been in the, in the journalist pool and again, I once had dinner with him for three hours before he became president, the night before he became president. I got a good sense of him. Um, the, the interesting thing about him is that he is not stupid. Uh, he's not highly educated. He is not, uh, was not an extraordinary personality when I met him, other than his obvious talents and his cunning and his, his thoughtfulness and his capacity to grasp what people wanted. What, what, what they're, he's psychologically very canny. But what, what, what it turns out is that the, that the Ukrainian people saw in him a reflection of them. And they correctly, 73% of the population correctly saw in him a placeholder or a representation of their own character traits. What Zelensky is in the, in the TV show and in reality, and he does come to power uh, having, played the, having played an ordinary man who becomes president and becomes an extraordinary president and represents the ordinary qualities of the ordinary Ukrainian, which become extraordinary and uh, destroy corruption. And so he comes to power play acting like he is Golubrotko from, from the, from the uh, TV program as opposed to an actor playing him. But in the, in the process, Pinocchio becomes a real boy and he becomes a real, a, a real man uh, by mirroring back the actual strength of the Ukrainian people. So the thing about Zelensky is that in, in politics, he's a, he's, a, he's a liberal moderate. He's not really politically canny in terms of political philosophy, though he studied law he never went to his law classes because he was off doing comedy and making money on the on the comedy uh, comedy circuit, and making films. What what he is as an individual and as an actor in the film and in the series and now in real life is a a, a, a metaphor for the for for the like the normy Ukrainian character traits, which are resilience, which are like kind of. Uh, um, collectivism, cohesion, coming to, together in the time of crisis, a kind of decency, a kind of common sense, a kind of internal strength, a kind of like blokish, guyish um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, thing. So he has, he has within him, inside of him, a reflection, you know, is, is he like every actor who plays a great man, uh, uh, an empty man? Is he an empty figure? No, he's, he, he has this normal Ukrainianness to him. He's an extraordinary man, but he's, he also represents the normy Ukrainian values. And he has a kind of connection to the average Ukrainian, which is why 73% of them voted for him. And they got it right. It turns out that the heuristics for them being him being like them were right. So he is a normal Ukrainian. And in, in, in extraordinary times, this ordinary Ukrainian does extraordinary things. So he is uh, a, a Jewish gentleman from a Russian speaking family, from intelligentsia family, who's a very good comedian and actor and good at making money and good at working hard. But it turns out he's, he is the representation of Ukrainian spirit in that in extraordinary times, he acts like a normal, ordinary Ukrainian. So that, that's, my, that's my thesis. Well, may I add a generic word here? Sorry? Uh, a generic word about yeah. war, okay. First of all, I, not knowing any of this, I identified Zelensky with the corporal in Soviet war films where there was always the Ukrainian corporal who just said no. There was in the war film, there was a stubborn Ukrainian corporal. And yeah, he fits yeah. that, you know, I don't know if you remember that, but this was a kind of cliche that in the Ukrainians were non-commissioned officers and this is the stuff Ukrainian, the one who says no, when the Germans say withdraw and all that stuff. You know, the Kazakhs were the ones who got killed defending the line. The Ukrainian is the one who says no, you know, Dafka, as they say. The other thing is the war really is the great contingency. In, in October 1940, 
the thoroughly mediocre Greek dictator Metaxas, uh, Mussolini gave him an ultimatum in October 1940, which is withdraw, we're advancing from Albania, we want Northern Greece. And Metaxas, who was a totally mediocre guy and a dictator and unpopular, answered with the Greek word ohi, which means no. That no of this mediocre guy kind of went through Greece and the Greeks always chatted boxes. They decided that their only slogan was Ohi, no. And they counterattacked the Italians so badly that Mussolini's venture into global conquest ended up with the Italians being pushed back right into Albania and collapsing. And who was that leader? It was a person much less than Zelensky. He was not a trained entertainer. As I say, he was a rather dour, bleak, and unpopular dictator who just said no to Mussolini. And if I, the broader comparison would be Churchill, who was just about a failed politician. And by 1938, he was a failed politician, you know, always ranting about war, ranting about war, uh, definitely uh, much less than other people. And then what happened is that when the war happened, and uh, then Churchill, who had been a one note musician all his life, that one note was the right note, which yep. is the fans. Zelensky may be said to be greater than both because Zelensky was actually uh, somebody who had a lot of discretion in his role and he didn't have a, like a lifetime Churchillian background. No. to drive him into that position, nor was he a dictator the way Metaxas was, a bleak and unpopular dictator uh, who was like to say no. And he said no to Mussolini, flat out. In the, you know, and it, they sent him a verbose declaration of war calling for negotiations and he said no. And that got going and it was good enough to, to have a Greek victory in effect. So today, the Russians have run into this contingency called war. For a, a people so obsessed with war that have studied war really quite seriously, it's a very strange thing that they slipped up on the banana called war. Namely, that war changes everything. It changes the German policy from, a, from completely from black to white, changes everybody's attitude like the white, and it changes your enemy. Zelensky, I mean, Zelensky could have crumbled. It's possible, it's humanly possible. He could have crumbled. Uh, if it didn't feel well, he had a severe headache or stomachache, he had fallen with COVID, I don't know what. Instead, they run straight into a contingency and put his problem is that this is voluntary. He went into it voluntarily. That was his voluntary decision to play the gambit. Yeah. That's why this crisis is going to end with him out of power. I agree. Uh, Mr. Lutvak, uh, I have a question for you. I've, uh, I, I've spent the entire day in the last two days discussing with my, with my friends, journalists, whether Putin really will be stopped from bombing Kiev. And there, there are good arguments for both sides. Uh, there are also, uh, I mean, we have, we have two minutes left, but maybe we will just talk about this for one more minute before, uh, if Jeremy wants to give us another question. But it, there are tons of Orthodox churches and Orthodox uh, monasteries here. Yeah. It's very difficult to bomb a city which is full of Russian Orthodox. Uh, the logic, uh, the logic of bombing, apart from the Orthodox churches and the Lavra, okay, Lavra, where yeah. Russian yeah. Christianity was born, okay, apart That's from right. the Lavra, the, the thing is that you threaten to bomb the city unless the government surrenders. So the way bombing Kiev, uh, by the way, the Russians do not have. 500 heavy bombers, okay? If they don't use nuclear weapons, they're not going to do anything like the British bombing of German cities in World War II. It's going to be yeah. still not very impressive mm -hmm. compared to that. The way bombing should, should be used in a situation like this is, uh, we are enemies, Mr. Zelensky, if you don't stop resisting, if you don't drop your weapons and stop resisting, we will bomb Kiev. Okay. And they can't do that because do that. Zelensky has already said, I'm resisting even if I'm going to die. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not like on the eve of a war, you 
tell the guy saying, if you resist, I will bomb your capital city. You can't do that once this engagement, because Zelensky uh, obviously is not going to surrender, okay? No, it's not going to surrender. Surrender is not part of his uh, possible responses. And the Russians, on the other hand, cannot bomb the Kiev. You mentioned the Orthodox churches. You should mention the Lavra, which is the oldest Christian. The whole thing is in Kiev. But apart from that, remember, this war is fought to help the poor Ukrainians and liberate them from these drug addicts and neo-Nazis. Bombing population indiscriminately doesn't fit with this thing. It collides with it. Again, that's an order that Putin can give that will not be executed, will not be executed, but might lead to his execution. So I don't believe that they're going to order the okay. indiscriminate bombing. Also, they don't have the bombers. The bombers, to make a big impression, you need to send 500 bombers over, over Kiev dropping mm -hmm. tons of bombs. They don't have them. They don't have them. They already had to employ the Tupelo F-95, which is an intercontinental maritime reconnaissance aircraft. They had to already employ it to, to hit, to drop some bombs at the airfield. And they don't have 500 of them, okay? No. So they don't have the capability and it wouldn't work for them. It's just, bombing is an ultimatum thing. You would, if you don't lie down, I'm going to bomb your city. And that is simply not credible in the circumstances. Jeremy? Well, as much as I'd like to keep going, uh, we do have to end here, but I hope that means uh, the two of you will join us again at some point as things develop. But for now, uh, Edward Lutwak and Vladislav Davidson, thank you so much for talking us through this. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. So, this has been a lot of fun. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Mr. Lutwak. Goodbye, Davidson, and you and Chernovitz, which was once, which was once a big, it was a city where people spoke German and Hebrew, not and Yiddish. filthy Yiddish. They were Yiddish. Married, only the poor in Chernovitz. The educated people spoke German and Hebrew in Chernovitz. We'll write the and it was the cultural capital. Uh, Schumpeter, Professor Schumpeter was teaching at Chernovitz, not at Vienna. He was the leading economist, and the graduates of Chernovitz, the Jews from Chernovitz, there's a volume this size. One became English lords, Nobel Prize winners, Israeli yeah, yeah. generals. Right. You're in the heart of the. Most, I know, I know. I've, most I've, I've been here before many times. Jewish I community love it. in Europe by far, Chernovitz. My, my grandmother was born here, actually. So yes. I, I, know, I know this town very well. Uh, there must be a thousand Jews left, or five hundred, maybe. There's of all the Jewish communities in Ukraine, this is the one that is that is uh, uh, that is dying the fastest. So we yes. have to go. We have to say bye goodbye bye. To, our, to our friends. Bye bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye